So, some of you may not be aware of this, but Poland is fucking based. That's right, Poland, despite all of the Poland ball memes, is by far one of the most awesome countries in the European Union. Although it is really barely a part of it at this point. And in this video, which is likely to be a little bit maybe shorter than some of my others, at least by my standard, we're going to go over just exactly why Poland is so based, and why Poland is potentially part of the real future of Europe, if Europe is to have any future at all. Over the last few months, we have seen numerous examples of just how freaking awesome Poland is. But again, I think many people are not aware of this, particularly people in the United States and outside of Europe. As such, and particularly given that I joined Duolingo last year for the express purpose of learning Polish, and not for good reasons, guys, I, I really just am extremely into the Wadesman series and I wanted to learn Polish, and I've done very little work, at least over the last year. Grzegorz. I did for a little bit, but I haven't been keeping up. But because I am very interested in Polish culture and language, and because, yeah, Poland's been kind of awesome of late, I think it's time that we talked just a little bit about how bangin' Poland and a lot of East Europe is. So, with that said, yep, pierdele kurwas! Let's get to talking about Poland, shall we? And while I really want to talk about modern Poland, we kind of really can't start there. We have to go back to look into the history of Poland to really understand the current events. Not only because it's important to understand modern Polish politics, but also because I think it's something that, again, many people, particularly non-Polish people, are likely unfamiliar with. And let me say this up front, guys. Let's be very frank, I am not the History Channel. I'm not a YouTube History Channel. And though I would love to talk at length about the history of Poland, such as it has existed for over a thousand years, I neither have the time in a single video, nor by far any sort of historical acumen to do so. And as such, will therefore be giving only the briefest and most simplistic of overviews of Polish history, primarily focusing on the last 300 or so years. Just be aware before we get into it that Poland is an ancient land and a very ancient people, and although this video will be primarily focused upon them, it will also be highly related to other nations in the region that share a lot of the same or similar history, and that have gone through some of these same struggles that Poland has gone through in the current year. But let's start by going all the way back to the late 1500s with the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. The fact is that the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth was a massive empire that played a huge role in Eastern Europe during the late Renaissance period, including having a long and storied history in the removal of kebabs, having, as a deeply Catholic people, spent hundreds of years fighting in the various crusades, although it seems that historically they probably did a little bit more of protecting European lands than retaking the Holy Land. Still, as were most Europeans at the time, they were heavily involved in the various crusades. But in particular, the Poles had a hell of a lot to do with protecting European lands from the encroaching Ottoman forces. In particular, the Battle of Vienna, fought in 1683, is often cited as the major turning point in the siege of the Islamic Ottoman Empire upon Christian European civilization, and was a victory due in a very large part to the Commonwealth, the Winged Hussars. By far the most banging mounted unit of all time, mind you. Fight me on this, and you'll be sure to fail as hard as the Ottomans did. All under the leadership of John Sobieski III, whose name also graces my most beloved of all vodka brands. The Polish were so adept at kebab removal, the Battle the Battle of Vienna is viewed by many historians as one of the most important victories in the then 300 year on Ottoman Habsburg War. But these great victories were not without cost. Following the death of Sobieski, Poland became more or less a puppet state under indirect control of other European countries, or rulers, be it Austria, Russia, or Prussia, across which the nation was partitioned beginning in the late 1700s. And with the beginning of the 1800s, with the official collapse of the Commonwealth, Poland as a modern nation had already been through a tumultuous period of being formed and then torn apart again and again over the course of about 100 years, despite numerous rebellions and attempts at re-establishing sovereignty on the part of the Polish people. By the time of the First World War, as a territory claimed by both Russians and Germans alike, Poland was a highly contested area and the site of great violence and tragedy, with the scorched earth policies of both Russia and Germany leaving hundreds of thousands of Poles dead. 
Despite being granted nation status under the Treaty of Versailles, Poland was quickly besieged again, this time by the newly formed Soviet Russia in an attempt to reclaim the land. And although Poland won, finally, after about 20 years of relative independence, and despite the Polish-German non-aggression pact, Poland was conquered by the Nazi forces in 1939. Now, I need to be clear here. There has never been much love between the German and Polish people, with an old Polish proverb saying, as long as the world will exist, the Pole will never be the German's brother, a sentiment which appears to have been typically mutual throughout history. Part of the Treaty of Versailles granted the land around the city of Danzig, called the Corridor, to the newly established Polish nation, a land that had a very large German population, and there was a great deal of ethnic German displacement that occurred in this region and other regions of Poland, beginning during the First World War and going on into the intermediary years until the second. Although it is difficult to nail down very specific information about what exactly happened in precise detail to the ethnic Germans left in the corridor and other parts of Poland during the years that led up to its invasion by the Nazis, given the large amount of propaganda distributed on all sides, it does seem very likely that Germans were being persecuted, if not outright murdered, during the intermediary years between the First and Second World War in Poland, particularly during the violent impetus behind the invasion, or at least the impetus that the German propaganda machine used to spur on German soldiers, known as Bloody Sunday, in which potentially hundreds of Germans and many Poles as well were killed in a conflict. Regardless of the veracity of these claims, some of which, those once again, generally originating from German propaganda machine, listed the death toll of Germans in Bloody Sunday in the tens of thousands. They were utilized to rally German citizens in support of the invasion of Poland in 1939. Remember though that Poland had been a country in flux over at this point about 150 years by the time the Nazis conquered the nation. And regardless of any persecution that the Germans faced in Poland, which they likely did face during the years in between wars, the suffering of the Polish people did in no way end just there with the basic Nazi occupation. There was massive loss of life under the Nazi regime, given that Polish people as Slavs were considered the Untermensch, lesser peoples, and thereby that their land sort of more or less just belonged to the Reich. Poland was, after all, the home of all of the actual quote, death camps, rather than the majority of camps under the Nazi regime, which were more or less labor camps. People didn't really die in those camps until the last couple of years or months of the war when the Nazis could no longer afford to feed their prisoners and allow them to die of starvation. But the actual death camps that did engage in some active extermination of human life, yeah, those were all in Poland. And while given that history is written by the victors, much of the information involving and regarding the Holocaust and what occurred in these camps and across both Germany and Poland during this period is obfuscated, and as such the death toll of both Poles and Jews who died under the Nazi regime is highly contentious and potentially questionable, please don't fucking destroy my channel, it is without question, I think, that hundreds of thousands of Polish lives were lost between conflict and incarceration under the Nazi regime. Although I would like to point out that the Poles did come up with some ingenious methods of trying to protect their homeland and those who lived within it in small ways during the occupation, such as the invention of claims of a typhus infection to keep the Nazis out. And despite their valiant efforts to aid and help the Allies, particularly as fighter pilots helping the Brits. I don't think enough people know that it was the highest scoring squadron during the Battle of Britain. And of course, that's even more impressive given that it entered the battle a little bit later than many of the squadrons. So it was a hugely uh, significant effort they did, a massive contribution. Following the war, Poland was left open and unprotected by their former allegiances, by the Allies, who essentially abandoned Poland to the hands of Stalin, right into his filthy commie mitts. You might think, woo lad, there's no way things could possibly get worse for a single group of people after being conquered by the Nazis, right? Well, wrong. It gets worse in the form of communism, as following the conquer by the Nazis, the Poles fell under the control of the USSR and communist Russia. And as we all know, communism has never failed only because it's totally never been tried. And when you find instances of communism being attempted, that doesn't count because it's not real communism, just as it surely wasn't in the case of Poland, where people starved and died and suffered under communism. Poland was obviously, by far, not the only country that suffered greatly under communism that was affected by the multiplicitous issues associated with the communist regime of the USSR. And interestingly, we find similar traits associated with the, quote, basedness of Poland across many other former Soviet states. 
now reasserting their nation status in the post-Soviet age. It's almost like if you lived in a Soviet nightmare hellhole for 50 years, you come out the other side quite aware of all the problems and concerns involved with communism and socialism, eh? And that's the point I kind of want to make here. When the Berlin Wall fell and the Soviet Union was disbanded, Poland, as with almost all of the previous Soviet states, had essentially been reduced to a third world status, with little access to many of the modern conveniences and luxuries that had become ubiquitous across the rest of the first world. This is one of the reasons why we joke about how Adidas was so popular across the Gopnik or in Poland the Dresi sort of class of individuals. It was a foreign product difficult to access and thereby far more desirable. <laughs> That's a psychological reactance for you, I suppose. You could ask Cialdini about his scarcity effect. Thus, access and acceptance into the European Union was a massive boon, not only for Poland, but for many of the former Soviet states, such as the Czech Republic, Hungary, and Bulgaria. The interesting thing to note about all of these countries is that today, they all seem to share a similar mindset when it comes to things like Muslim immigration and this whole immigration crisis that is besieging Europe. It is almost like, as I mentioned above, that they kind of have an idea of what it's like to have their nations controlled and conquered by foreign invaders and refuse to just lie over and allow themselves to be fucked in the asshole as they have been in the past. It's almost as if, strangely enough, due to the effects of being kept under the Eastern Bloc Soviet bubble for so long, they were also kind of protected from Western progressive politically correct brainwashing that has absolutely inundated and in some ways destroyed most of Western Europe. Despite all of the bad and all of the suffering, the starvation and the poverty that occurred across many of these former Soviet states as a response to their subjugation under the Soviet Union, in a way, it was kind of a benefit. Poland, along with many other Eastern European nations, were essentially placed into a time capsule that was only opened in the early 1990s, and as such, they were kept separated from some of the social and political changes that affected the rest of the West over the course of the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Thus, Poland, a country which for about 250 years has been denied its sovereignty, has finally become a succinct nation and has been made a part of the European Union. Which, strangely enough then, appears to be dedicated to the self-destruction of Europe through the massive importation of third-world Muslim migrants, who the Poles have proved historically at being excellent at physically removing. Obviously, this presents a conflict of interest. Or, if you are convinced as such that the Polish people and their distaste regarding the massive, predominantly Muslim migration to Europe is simply proof that the Poles are a bunch of raging racists, and they themselves need to learn a lesson. They need to take in a couple of millions of refugees, right? And you wouldn't be wrong there, honestly. The Poles appear to love their nation and have been trying to protect their lands from invaders for over 10 centuries. But have I not just explained why they might feel that way today? They just got their nation back after almost 300 years of confusion, disarray, multiple types of conquering, and partitioning. Gee, why might it be then that the Polish are so patriotic? Well, apparently, that right there, patriotism, that's the real problem. Recently, the Polish people celebrated their national holiday, a celebration of their nationhood, sincerely expressing their happiness and support of the concept of the Polish nation as its citizens. Now, how was this event reported by the international media as much as it was? Well, lads, it was a white nationalist outburst, you know, like a bimbo eruption for us Americans, I suppose, that indicated an enormous rise in... <laughs> Can you guess the ideology? Well, let me give you a couple of seconds. Here we go. Guess the ideology. What was this celebration of the founding of modern Poland representative of? I'll give you a couple seconds, fam. Did you guess Nazism? Well, then you would be correct. That's right. Nazism in Poland. The nation that was conquered by the Nazis. A nation where potentially millions were slaughtered. And I'm not saying in the Holocaust, but slaughtered through war, slaughtered through famine, slaughtered through suffering. Yeah, those people who are now throwing confetti in the streets are only doing so to support Nazism by uh, celebrating their uh, independence from Nazism and any other controlling factors, including communism. Yeah, uh, that's clearly what this indicates, <laughs> obviously. That's the only logical option here.
Or at least that's the way that it was perceived by the fine journalist at, for example, Newsweek. Now, Newsweek, I know you're not the brightest bunch of bulbs in the pack, but if you think that waving around a flag that contains the colors both red and white and construe it for some sort of Nazi synology as a as a Reichskriegsflagge, then uh, just want to point out that maybe you should take a look at your own logo because I think you're Zieg hailing here as well then. Yes, that's right. This display of nationalism is clearly just some sort of crypto-fascist secret signaling on a mass level. Not a true display of a people who are happy after, again, hundreds of years to finally have their nation back. To be able to fly their flag, to be able to show their symbols with pride. No, not at all. That cannot possibly be the case. The fact is that the Polish people are happy to have their country back. That's the reality. And just how happy are they? Well, take a look, because it's the current year, and this display of pure nationalism was reported as racism. Yes, racism in a country that is pretty much entirely white. And you know what? I guess that right there, that's the issue now, isn't it? Poland just hasn't been culturally enriched enough to hate its history and culture and symbols. Now, has it? The irony is that these Poles, just happy in the celebration of their culture, were being called Nazis. And that irony, it's not lost upon me, nor should it be lost upon anyone. That is ironic. The people conquered by the Nazis and then again by the Soviets finally get their nation back and how dare they feel some pride in the culture that they were finally able to regain. This is to me proof definitive of how the EU has no real interest in preserving the cultures of the distinct countries that comprise it, but rather is merely interested in creating a gray mixture of culture with no individual cultural distinctiveness. People talk about a white ethno state, but the fact of the matter is European cultures are all fairly disparate. Poland wants very little to do with Germany as far as I understand and vice versa, for instance. These are distinct cultures, and the people of Poland want to celebrate theirs. And as far as I'm concerned, and I think anyone should be concerned, good on them. It took them 300 years to get their true independence. And you want to shit on them over that? You want them to cease in this celebration? Thankfully though, we do have nations like Poland. Poland is not yet lost, and she will not allow her culture to be destroyed in the waves of multiculturalism that are being enforced by the EU. And the polls have made their opinion towards this push overwhelmingly evident, with, for example, this publication from 2017, which depicted a woman clad in the flag of the European Union being grabbed and molested by, well, mostly brown hands. Poland wants nothing to do with your multi culty bullshit. While Poland has obviously the most based MEP in the entirety of the EU, perhaps the only one willing to speak the truth about the problems faced by Europe through the mass importation of Muslims and the migration of Muslims to the region. Ameryka zbudowała potęgę, bo przyjmowała imigrantów chcących pracować, bo nie dawała im żadnych zasiłków. A my niszczymy Europę. I ta polityka jest w przypadku upadku Europy. Dziękuję za uwagę. It is not alone in its concerns with the changing landscape of Europe. Although all countries in the EU are currently expected to take in their own very large, fair share of predominantly Muslim migrants from war-torn countries that are, um, well, massively not at war, or predominantly not at war, the population of which contains, ooh, as we've been over, almost exclusively adult fighting age males, yeah, Poland is at least in some ways leading the way in a general disgust in Eastern Europe toward unwanted foreigners who many people see as invaders and perhaps with good reason. I mean, let's look at this map of terrorist attacks in Europe. Does anything kind of stand out to you? Oh, namely the fact that there haven't been any in Poland? Hmm, gee, I wonder why that might be. Really, gets the old noggin joggin, eh? Now you might say, wow, Aiden, what a bunch of racists these Poles are. But I would propose to you in contrast, first, Islam's not a race. These are people of all different races. So, okay, that to start out with. But secondly, is it not the right of people who have 
in particular, suffered from disorganization and destruction of their nation for nearly 300 years, and moreover, have only re-established the very concept of their country, their concept of what it is to be Poland within the last 20 to 30, that they don't want to import thousands of people who fundamentally are unlikely to integrate to Polish culture. If we look at other countries in the EU, we find that Middle Eastern migrants and migrants from a lot of African countries rarely even learn the language of their new host nation and tend to be far more likely to be unemployed and rely on public assistance. Why would the Poles, who just gained their country back, wish to accept these people? Why would the Poles, who are a deeply Catholic people, wish to accept so many non-Catholic migrants who are very unlikely to adapt and acclimate to Polish culture? Dr. Lehman did an excellent video on this where he went into it in some extreme detail and read a lot of studies that I frankly can't read because I read neither German nor French. So here's a little clip from that and please go check out the entire video, I will link it below. Poland as a nation has been particularly outspoken about this, despite its continued membership in the EU, which is contentious as of right now. But they are far from the only nation to express these concerns. Following a recent demand that Poland take in more Muslim migrants, which they've basically taken in none, a Polish politician demanded in place that the German government, being more or less the head of the EU, pay a trillion dollars in reparations to Poland for the war crimes incurred during the Second World War under the Nazi regime. Despite any real response to the request, this was a message to the EU that Poland was essentially not to be fucked with. And the Poles are still telling the EU to fuck off. And again, they're not alone. Hungary is right there along with them. Now there are NGOs essentially begging the EU for more money and gives so that they can support migrants in countries like Hungary and Poland because, frankly, the government wants fucking nothing to do with it. And speaking of Poland's bestie Hungary, they too have taken some fairly intense measures to prevent unwanted migrants during this ongoing European, quote, migrant crisis, with some MEPs suggesting that pigs potentially be used along the border to terrify and scare off Muslim migrants, or in nearby Bulgaria with the ongoing escapades of a vigilante who is more or less allowed to do as he wishes by the government, and roams across the countryside in advanced paramilitary gear, including a helicopter and a tank, on the lookout for illegal migrants, well, it's clear that most of these post-Soviet nations want fucking nothing to do with these predominantly Muslim migrants. Now, isn't it? Poland is not alone in this. Eastern Europe is fed up. And why might that be? Is it just because they're a bunch of white racists? Well, that sort of depends again on your definition of racism. As far as I'm concerned, given Islam is not a race but a religion, and these countries have generally a thousand year old history, if not more, of kicking Muslims out of European lands, I would say this is more of a cultural disagreement than a racial one. But hey, you can be the judge of that. For most of these nations, Poland included, they were deprived of expressing their national identity for years as members of these impoverished and repressed Soviet Eastern Bloc states. These hardy and strong, industrious people suffered under the essential culturelessness that communism requires. They lost their identity, they lost their religion, they lost their culture, and as such, when they came back from the restrictions under which they were held under communism, many of them were desperate for a return to the cultures of their forefathers, to their history, to their ancestry. Given communism's denial of religion and individual cultures be replaced with the state as totally representative of all culture, from the family to the national level, it is no wonder why these people were so starved for their own history. If you have some kind of gut response to this as negative, I would ask you, friend, why? Why is it such a bad thing for the Polish to want to be, well, Polish, to celebrate Polish culture? But why is it not a bad thing in turn for the Japanese to want to be Japanese? For the Israelis to want to be Jewish? If you feel a negative gut response to the idea of Polish culture reasserting itself in place of other cultures, I would suggest, perhaps, my friends, that you've been just a tiny bit indoctrinated into the cult of liberalism, maybe in ways you haven't even considered. The fact is that if you think it's okay for one culture to maintain its individuality, to maintain itself as independent, such as the Japanese, then it should be similarly okay for the Polish. My tomodachi, my colega. 
What I think may be most disturbing to those who like to claim that this rise in nationalism in Poland and other Eastern European nations is akin to Nazism, again, hilarious in its irony, is that many of those who seem so keen to speak out about their love for their nation are young people, 20 or 30-somethings who grew up either during the end of the Soviet era or shortly after its end. And that means they're people who experienced just how awful life was under communism and foreign rule without the ability to express pride in their own people or culture. They're not some weird, conservative old farts, as we typically like to portray conservatives, or at least have traditionally in the United States over the last couple of decades. Again, they're 20 and 30-somethings. They know what it is like, and thereby it is no surprise that they are unwilling to become slaves to a foreign invader, to a foreign culture again. It is time for Poland to be Poland once more. The Polish are clearly a proud people, and their pride for their culture is overwhelming from the examples that we can see at any real level, originating from Poles both young and old, although again, it is from the youth that we are seeing a massive rise in nationalism in Poland. That is not to say, of course, that there aren't problems in Polish politics. For example, the government is, from my very outside perspective, and feel free to shit on me in the comments if you believe me to be wrong, apparently more or less controlled by the Vatican, given again that Poland is a deeply religious and highly Catholic. Catholic nation. Religion, however, is one of those very things that makes Poland Poland and allows it to remain distinct in that in the generally post-religious agnostic world of the EU, Poland and many other post-Soviet countries still rely upon their religious identity to define themselves. And you can say, oh, hey man, religion is doo-doo, religion is so stupid, have you even read Darwin? But again, I have to ask you, if you have a problem with Poland being Catholic, why don't you have a problem with Saudi Arabia being Muslim? I'm not saying everybody fits that bill, just a general observation. Why should they invite in all of these Muslims who don't share their values and abandon their history as a deeply Catholic nation? Ask yourself that question, and if you have a problem, maybe it's time to think about it. Poland's association with Catholicism means a number of things. However, and in tandem, while it may have much to do with the disavowal of Muslim migrants, it also means that Poland has been a center of debates recently on, for example, abortion. There's also been a great deal of backlash towards gay rights in the gay community and gay marriage in the nation. Thus, if so far I have overly sold Poland as some sort of paradise, which I certainly did not mean to do, as I've said, Poland has many issues financially as well, for any of my liberal friends out there, just kind of be aware of this, you know? They're not going to take too kindly to your degeneracy. But again, it's only a problem if you think it's one. Just something to keep in mind, given that there are currently plenty of more liberal citizens wishing to flee to more so-called progressive nations that support gay rights and abortion more fully, as well as a mass of third world, predominantly Islamic migration. <laughs> so while we know the Polish have been more than a bit unwilling to go along with the EU when it comes to the importation of thousands, even millions of migrants from third world countries, that has very little to do with the United States, right? I mean, Poland is a member of NATO and thereby an ally of the US, and of course we would never allow anything very negative to affect our friend, the Polish, right? Um, oh, ex except what's this? A video critical of Muslim migration was put into limited state by Google, a company that receives benefits from the US government? Well, that seems a little hypocritical, does it not? Here's the thing. Regardless of your opinion on net neutrality, so long as Poland is a NATO member, it is antithetical to the United States to fund any company that offends a nation to which we are allies. So do you understand how fucked up this is, guys? This is an official YouTube channel, THE official YouTube channel of the nation of Poland, and one of their videos was placed in limited mode, meaning that it can't be commented on or easily shared. It was essentially hidden. Well, that sounds like the way to treat a US ally now, isn't it? And I must admit, guys, while the video was quickly taken out of limited state, the fact that it was placed in it at all is a little bit absurd, right? Could you imagine a video like this about how Sweden is dying and ethnic Swedes need to get the fuck over it being replaced, being put into a limited state because it's so offensive? Well, that would be just outright racist, surely. Yet the Polish people wishing to maintain their sovereignty, the sovereignty that they had been denied of and stripped of for 250 years, that was pause for concern from Google, right? That needed to be looked at very carefully and potentially hidden from people. And that's the reality of the situation, guys. Poland is a sovereign nation that is very proud of its culture and history, and rightly so. They are proud of finally reestablishing their nationhood. 
other countries, Germany in particular, never really experienced to the same level the starvation and the hardships and the desperation of living under the Eastern Bloc, although surely Germany has had plenty of their own shares of hardships, particularly under the Treaty of Versailles. And certainly Eastern Germany did, hence why you can see a bit of a difference in the population and how people vote between East and West Germany. But that, my friends, that appears to be the effect of living under the Eastern Bloc. It's why Eastern Europe is, I believe, Europe's only hope. As far as I can see as of the current year, <laughs> Western Europe has become more than just soft. It has become actively willing to destroy itself. While Eastern Europeans are desperately clinging to the culture that they were deprived of for over half a century. This is why I believe Poland is the future. Polska Silna. I support you, Poland. You and your extreme levels not only of beautiful nationalism, which sincerely brings me to tears sometimes. Like seriously, this brings me to tears but just sheer extremities of not giving a fucking shit. I salute you, colega, my friends. For everyone else, I suggest you take a look at Poland to see nationalism assert itself not only naturally, but healthily. And the fact that it apparently triggers leftists so much that they will call a nation conquered by the Nazis guilty of Nazism? Well, that's just fucking hysterical, at least to me, and it will never get old. Poland should stand as a shining example of Eastern Europe's ability to come back from the struggles of post-Soviet society, with its cities like Warszawa and Krakow being some of the most modern and impressive in the world, despite the huge amounts of setbacks that they've had to reach the place that they're currently at. I mean, sure, they're not the most, but they're doing quite well. The economy is successful, despite the massive disadvantages of having been Soviet shitholes not even 30 years ago. They're modern cities today. I guarantee you Trump wouldn't have any problem taking a little vacation in Warszawa. Although there are still many problems socially and economically in countries like Poland, her best friend she sadly shares no border with, Hungary, as well as Bulgaria, the Czech Republic, Serbia, Slovakia, Slovenia, etc. These countries should serve as examples of the potential future of Europe. People who are proud of their nations and of their history and their culture, and as such are unafraid to tell the EU to go fuck off when it comes to forcibly importing individuals from what is, let's be honest, an incompatible culture. Poland is strong. Poland is not yet lost. Nor is most of Eastern Europe. You beautiful Slavs, you beautiful Gulpniks, I think you will save Western civilization. And I'm serious about that, friends. Look at how willing nations like Sweden and Germany, most of all, seem to be to roll over and accept and allow their nations to die, to be usurped by foreign invaders, invaders that they welcome with open arms. As I mentioned early on, of course, the Poles have a long history of removing kebab, almost a thousand year history of doing so. And that combined with the fact that they only recently regained their long sought sovereignty is likely why they are not only unwilling to do the same, but are unabashed and unafraid to stand up to the newest attempt of Germany to usurp their independence. Thus, I wouldn't be surprised if in 50 years Vienna once again is in need of the modern equivalent of some winged hussars to ride into the city and retake it from its captors. While I don't support the idea that Western Europe should merely give up and accept their fate in the hope that perhaps the Slavs will come save them one day, it is true that Poland is not yet lost. And so long as Poland is not yet lost, nor do I believe it's Western civilization. Speaking as someone without a drop of Slavic ancestry, God bless you Poland, and God bless you all of Eastern Europe. You may very well be Europe's last hope. Help me. Polska. If you have enjoyed this video, please be sure to like and subscribe. I'm Aiden Paladin, Altana Volt. Well, I guess if you guys actually waited this long after the end of the credits, I, uh, I guess you deserve this. I, I did say on Twitter I was going to do it, but, but hang on, guys, it's gonna be really bad and you're all gonna make fun of me. So, uh, I'm only gonna do the, I'm only gonna do the chorus, okay? Uh, all right, here I go. Match, match, the broski, zimmy woski, and the boski, set a wheel, spread a Zwaś sejć, 
Marcz, marcz, ta proski, ziemny łoski, a do Polski, za to łyskę dał.